I'd like for you to turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Verse, beginning in verse 18. And the disciples of John and those of the Pharisees were fasting. And they come and say to him, that's Jesus, Why do the disciples of John and those of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? And Jesus said to them, Can the sons of the bride chamber, while the bridegroom is with them, fast? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they are not able to fast. But when the days will come, the bridegroom will have been taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And no one sews an unshrunk piece of cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the piece pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear takes place. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins and the wine is poured out. And the skins will be destroyed, but new wine is to be put into fresh wineskins. And it came to pass that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples began to make their way, plucking the ears. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Did you never read what David did when he had need and was hungry, he and those with him? How he entered into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the loaves of presentation, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and even gave to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made on account of man, and not man on account of the Sabbath. So then, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, in these moments that we have this morning to contemplate and think about these words of your Son and our Savior, we ask that you would make us to understand how these words apply to us today that you would draw us closer to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, there's three general topics that are in this passage. And if, you're, and if you notice that the words that I read don't exactly sound like your translation, it's because I translated it <laughs> from the Greek. Uh, but uh, there's three things in here. Most people think that the first topic that we looked at is about fasting. And it's really not about fasting. And we're going to look at what it is about. The second thing that we kind of noticed here that Jesus is, is implying is that... Uh, there's something new here now. Something new. And the third thing that he talks about is wisdom. And that's the three things we're going to look at this morning. But uh, I also would like to say that if you ever wonder what we're going through in this world right now, is exactly what Jesus was talking about, except it's actually being reversed. 
the new thing that Jesus brought is being rejected. And sadly, it's even being rejected by people that call themselves the church. And this so-called new world order is nothing but Hasatan's old order that got started in a big way back in Babylon. So that's what we're really looking at here. All right. Let's go back and look at these first few verses that a lot of people think is about fasting, but it's really not. Um, I want to point out first of all that you'll notice that the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees were fasting. Isn't that interesting? Now, the John that we're talking about is not the Gospel of John, John, not one of his, Jesus' disciples, but it's the disciple, it's, it's uh, John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist, of course, was cousin to Jesus. John the Baptist's dad was a priest. And so uh, John was following the old system. And uh, Jesus was not following the old proscribed system. I will put it that way. Um, he was following the spirit of the system. But he was not following the letter of the law of the system. Because, as you know, laws do not give life. And you see, that's what we're dealing with today, is people that are making laws that are actually killing people. They're jabbing people with death. They're jabbing children with death. And they're doing it under the color of law. Um... So, law does not give life. Now, some group of Jewish believers had come to Jesus and, and they asked a question. Now, I, I have to tell you, um, Christians that are listening to this, that you got to really be careful when people come up and ask a question. Because a lot of times they're setting you up. I was recently in a store, uh, a couple days ago in fact, and um, I have made up my mind, I don't wear the mask. And uh, they, uh, they came up, I, I, well, I saw a few people, most people were wearing the mask. But I came up to this one husband and wife, I assumed, and I was right, uh, and they were not wearing it, and I came up to them, and I gave them a thumbs up, and I said, I'm glad you're, you're not in favor of fascism. And that set off a nice discussion. The man is a doctor. And he said these doctors are willfully killing people. He said they know it, and he said if you have a doctor who honestly says he doesn't know it, he said he's a fool and doesn't know anything about medicine. Strong words. We had, we had a talk there in uh, this store for quite a while, and... Uh, as we were leaving, his wife said, she threw her arms out and hugged me. <laughs> and then she said, uh, she's looking for a church. I was hoping they'd be here today. <laughs> but uh, I told them about uh, uh, my channel on the internet and uh, maybe they wanted to look at that before they came out here. I don't know. But uh, anyhow, uh, 
Um, I told that story because one of the things that they had mentioned was that so many of the churches and the church that they had been going to, they have people in the church that are acting intolerant toward them because they don't wear a mask. Now this is something that I've heard repeatedly. We, we quit supporting a missionary because of this, because he had written in his letter that uh, he thought people should go to jail. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at um, this, this, is a, this is a spiritual war that has come out into the open. And you can see it. You can see it. Well, the spiritual war that Jesus was fighting here was uh, against formality in religion and all religion all all faiths i mean we're we're following form today because we've had prayer we've sung songs uh we've uh, sung the doxology uh and and now it's my turn to uh preach and that's form and there's nothing wrong with form unless the form has no meaning and the problem was was that there was a reason that Jesus disciples were not fasting and he explained it this is a time of celebration they were celebrating and learning from God's own be only begotten son they were living in his presence and I don't think a lot of people realize but they for three years we estimate maybe three and a half that's interesting if it would be three and a half because that's a prophetic number uh, but uh, for about that long they went everywhere in Israel with Jesus they ate with him, they slept with him, they, and uh, by the way, I meant they did not sleep with him the way wicked minds would say. Uh, but they, uh, they were with him all the time. Can you imagine that? To be with Jesus all the time? Well, let me tell you something. If you're born again, you are. Because he said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And the Holy Spirit lives in a Christian. So uh, we have an advantage that even the disciples did not have because they did not have the Spirit living in them until after he went back. So obviously there was something going on here. And that was, was that Jesus was something new. God was doing something new. Now, it was his plan all along for Jesus to come. And in the, as Paul says, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. But then he goes on and says something else that's kind of interesting. And no one sows an unshrunk piece of cloth on an old garment I want to ask people that are listening to this today are you cut from the same garment as everyone else there used to be an old phrase that people used to use and they would say oh they're cut out of the same cloth well, I think that's where this really comes back to, is this saying. Because you see, if we're sold on to Jesus, and that's what happens when you're saved, you get sold on to him, you're cut from the same cloth. Um, if he goes in one direction, you go with him. Um, now, there are some times 
where we don't follow him very closely and we have to get um, taken to the woodshed by, the, by his father. But there's something very important to notice here in this story. And, and this is where it comes to whether people are really followers of Christ or not. Because you see, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a new creation. If you're not, you're old. And that's where the problem is. If you're old cloth and you're being sewn onto new cloth and you get washed, it's, you're going to be torn away because you're not of the same cloth. And the issue also goes with uh, wineskins. Now, one of the things about wine is that we use that in communion. The wine represents the blood of Christ. Notice I did not say it is the blood of Christ. It represents it. It represents it. And so, uh, if you are trying to observe Christian teachings without being a Christian, you're spilling that wine if you take communion and you're not a believer. You say, well, wait a minute, I, I didn't spill any wine, I drank it. Well, you put it in a vessel that doesn't belong to him. You're spilling the wine. You're casting the bread on the ground if you don't belong to him. I can't tell you how many times in 40 years that I've seen people taking communion and I knew they weren't Christians. It bothered me. It bothered me. But I don't think there was anything I could do. You know, the Apostle Paul said in uh, Corinthians, he said that uh, there were some people that didn't hold Jesus in high regard when they were taking communion and he said and that's why some of you are sick and some of you sleep I have said that this illness that is going around this world has a spiritual dimension to it and uh, and and nobody's going to convince me otherwise I, I feel certain that there is a spiritual dimension to it and uh, can't understand why some people get sick and other people never get sick, no matter how much they're around it. Um, Jesus was not through, though, teaching. He had taught first about fasting. You don't fast because, oh, it's that, that date on the calendar. The only reason that a Christian should fast is to draw near to Jesus. And the disciples were near to him right then. That's why you draw, that's why you fast because you need to draw near to it. And Jesus is the new cloth. But there's, there's more that uh, is actually going on here. This, this is the part about wisdom, verse 23. They're going through a grain field. They're going along the edge. And of course, the law allows for the edges to be gleaned by the poor. You know, I don't know how many of you realize this, but Jesus owned one thing. He owned a Hart Schaffner and Marx suit. Did you know that? <laughs> okay. Now, they, now, I say that in that way, Hart Schaffner and Marx, because that was always, a, I don't know if they still work, but, they, but that was a very expensive suit. 
and the description of Jesus' garment that it was unable to be torn because it was woven that was a very expensive robe that was one thing he owned a very good suit of clothes in his day but that's all he owned and uh, so I, th I would tend to say if you have one set of clothes and that's all you own, that puts you in the poor category. And and I don't and the disciples, most of them were fishermen, and they had set their nets aside. They weren't earning a living for those three years. And with Judas being the uh, person person that carried the purse, and he was stealing from it. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know. So I'd say they were in the poor category. So they were allowed to go through a grain field and strip a few heads of wheat and then what they would do is they would spit in their hand and rub the kernels together and when the uh, outer coating of the wheat came off, well that was threshing the wheat and when they uh, spit in it and, and it made the uh, the the kernels stick together, the thresh kernels, well, that was making bread, you see. So the Pharisee says, well, these guys are threshing. These guys are making bread, and it's all on the Sabbath. And so Jesus turned around to his great, great, great granddaddy, David, and said, um, the great king of Israel, David, he took bread. Is, you notice nobody asked him where that is, but I would like you to read that in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 6. So the priest gave him, that was David, consecrated bread. Actually, the word in Hebrew is just consecrated. Everybody understood it was bread. For there was no bread there, but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before Jehovah in order to put hot bread when it was taken away. Um, and you say, where does that come from? Exodus 25, verse 30. And you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. And then we'll go up a few more chapters in Exodus chapter 29, uh, verses 32 and 33, and you'll read, And Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket, that's the show bread, at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And of course that was before the temple, that was the tabernacle. Thus they shall eat those things by which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But a layman shall not eat them because they are holy. So it was pretty well clear that David was violating something, but did God punish David for that? No. Why didn't he punish him? Good question. Jesus is telling them that there's a principle here. And the principle goes to the heart of what even modern day Judaism is all about. And that's Sabbath. Now, I will tell you, in our area, uh, in our local newspaper, uh, there's somebody that uh, writes there uh, free to the newspaper. And they're from a Seventh-day Baptist church. And there are also Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, both of them say, we're not worshiping on the Sabbath. Guess what? I know that. <laughs> uh, the book of Acts knows that. Because the early church, very early on, began worshiping two days a week. Saturday and Sunday last day of the week and first day of the week 
and you know as you look at the progression of the early church you find out more and more references as time goes on the Lord's Day the Lord's Day who whose day was the Lord's Day the day he rose from the dead is the Lord's Day that's Sunday now I know people will like to talk about the Roman Catholic Church and they'll like to get into all these different things but folks all I can tell you is is as a person that studied history and a person that does a lot of research there's nothing wrong with worshiping on Sunday I would also say if you want to worship on Saturday there's nothing wrong with that however when you start saying uh, drawing a line in the sand and saying you cross that you're wrong no you now are wrong you now are the Pharisee you now are the legalist and as I started off this message law does not bring life law brings condemnation to the law observer because you see what you're doing is you're saying oh well I can I can be good in and of and by myself and the Bible says there is no good among any of us at all you know there's one more example in Mark and that's found in Mark 14 uh, verses 3 to 8 and and I'm not I'm just going to give you I'm not going to read all those verses but I'm just going to give you a little synopsis of the first few verses you see there is a woman who wanted to worship Jesus and to pay him an honor and she did so with a very expensive alabaster vase that was full of a very expensive ointment perfume Spike nard is one of the words that they use to describe it. And they start criticizing her. You know who that was? I bet you they criticized her. Judas. In fact, one of the Gospels does name him as Judas. Because he was thinking about, boy, that's a, that's a hundred bucks worth of stuff there. I could have gotten my hands on that. But instead, he says, oh, we could have used that to buy bread for the poor. You see, that's, that's the way the religious lost like to talk. They, they like to fool you. They like to fool other people that aren't religious lost, but are, are saved. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to, let me say that the way he, I think he said it. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? That's the way I think Jesus said it. She has done a good work to me. Now here's the interesting word that I want to say. For the poor you always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do them good, but you do not always have me and look at this. Here's a woman that saw what Jesus was going to go. Here's, here's a woman who has her eyes of prophecy opened. The disciples didn't even see this. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. You know, it's been pointed out that after the cross... They had to run and take him down in a hurry and, and uh, put him in the sepulcher. They didn't do a good job of burying him. That's why everybody was coming back after the, uh, the high holy days were over. They wanted to do it right. But he had been done right by this woman.
Jesus said in Matthew 12, 5, Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? I'm going to tell you something. I've been a pastor for over 40 years and I have broken all the times that I've preached because you see that's my job <laughs> and I get paid for that in fact sometimes when I was pulpit supplying for somebody they gave me a check when I was done they paid me on said, oh preacher I'm not going to listen to you anymore because you are just so folks you either serve the Lord of the Sabbath or you don't serve him at all. But he doesn't want you serving the Sabbath. Are you part of the body? You see, that story Jesus told about David and those with, that were with him, they were part of the body. And God said, they're hungry, go ahead, Abiathar, give them some bread. Give them my bread. By the way, all the bread on the earth belongs to God because He created the land, He created the water, He created the seed, and He created the farmer. It all belongs to Him. Trouble is, there's an awful lot of what I call freelancers today. They don't recognize the ownership that God has. They think they're independent of Him. And um, nobody's independent of Him, but if that's the way your mind is, one day you will be independent of Him forever in a very hot place. So the question is, Do you serve fasting? Or is fasting a way that you get to know the Lord? Do you serve the Sabbath? Or the Lord of the Sabbath? You see, we're in a world today in which the old wineskin is trying to refer to itself as the new wineskin. The old wineskin's the new world order and, the, and, the, and it's and it's really Babylon. The new wineskin is believers that are not going to serve Babylon. 2 Timothy 1.7 Paul says, For God has not given us, us as believers, We've trusted in the finished work of Christ on the cross and His shed blood. And we have His Holy Spirit living in us. That's the us. For God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. The Greek word is dailyis. We don't have a spirit of cowardice. But of power dunamis, dynamite, and love, agape, selfless love, not selfish love, and wise discretion is the literal translation of that last word, sophronismu, wise discretion. I pray that people will start using wise discretion soon in the church in this country around this world let's pray Father we thank you for your word we thank you for your son we thank you for your spirit Father we depend on you and these gifts of your spirit, your word, and your son, the living word. Draw us close to you and make us like him.
Therefore we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.